Uh, okay. All right, so as a reminder, so far in the class, we discussed the maximal informative nonlinearity for a single neuron, where the solution is to, um, if, if the, the neuron is not noisy, then um, the nonlinearity is the cumulative distribution of the input signal. And if it is noisy, then um, noisy binary neuron, then the optimal solution is to cut the input distribution in half. Then we discussed maximal informative solutions for two neurons and how they um, coordinate their thresholds. Then last lecture, we discussed optimal filtering in a linear multidimensional case. And today I will... Um, and give some additional examples on, on the optimal filtering in the multivariate case because my sense is that it wasn't, um, I wasn't sufficiently clear and I will give you additional examples. And uh, today, uh, the plan is uh, for today is um, um, to prepare for analyzing multidimensional case with multiple neurons. So for that, we need to understand how to read out information from large neuronal arrays. So I will ask, um, um, I will present some background material from the information th um, theory textbook, and then you, you can let me know if um, it is uh, too familiar, but the necessary material includes um, knowing data processing inequality um, mark of chain, uh, chain rule for information, what is the sufficient statistics, and then I will derive the sufficient statistics for large neural population um, and show that it, it actually exists, there is a simple readout, and, um, and then we will talk about computing this uh, formula for large neural arrays and then apply it to retinal data. So that's a material, um, depending on um, questions and so on, maybe it will be some of the lecture today and on Monday. So um, to go back to the optimal uh, filtering in the multivariate case, I want to begin with a demonstration. So it's in the PowerPoint. So, it's um, the, you will be able to see, uh, it's a little psychophysical experiment, and you will be able to see these effects that um, I was describing, or um, we will go over it one more time, on, on yourself. So, the experiment goes like this. Um, you, you see these two photographs? Yeah. They're okay, they're identical, and there is a blue dot. And we are supposed to look at the blue dot, but then I will, um, so right now these images are identical. Then I will show you the images like this, so you can keep looking at the blue dot, and uh, the two images are um, either blurred or sharpened, so the frequency contents is changed. So let's look for it for maybe 30 seconds. And then I will switch to the original two images and you will tell me what you see. Okay. So did um, did the through Zoom, I, I'm hoping that you, what you were supposed to see that once you are, the two eyes or different parts of the visual space are adapted to different frequency content. When you switch to original images, then there is a transient and the, um, 
the the image where the statistics was um, sharper looks blurry, and the one that is uh, was blurry looks sharper, and then it um, normalizes to the baseline. Did everybody see that, or do I need to make I it bigger? I think so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I think this. I I like this illustration because what I was talking about last lecture. Um, pertains to uh, you know single neurons, but because every single neuron does it, you you know you, you see that it's you know true. <laughs> so uh, at the level of the uh, of the brain. So here is a little bit more background on um, the experiment that I described last time. So. In this case, the neurons so in the cat are presented either with white noise or with natural scenes. So white noise in the Fourier domain will have a flat spectrum and natural scenes has this, um, um, so this is actually the logarithm of the power spectrum, one over F structure, so it's much more correlated. And, um, Okay, and then what, and then if we have natural scenes times a filter pass through nonlinearity, then um, let's see. Um, so this is the data I described um, last time. So you have stimuli uh, now as a cross section. Natural scenes have bigger power than white noise, and the neural filters change within a certain range of frequencies here, low, frequency, um, low frequencies. And then after that, they go to um, um, same nonlinearity, um, same filtering part. And um, um, if you look in the temporal domain, then in the same range of spatial frequencies, the change is in the opposite direction meaning because the natural scenes are smoother at higher temporal frequencies, then there is an extra um, enhancement at low spatial frequencies but high temporal frequencies, and then they, they match to the same uh, filtering part. So that's um, um, the, the review from uh, last lecture. Any questions on the filtering part? So is it clear what the relation between uh, these plots uh, and uh, the excess, I mean the experiments that we did uh, with the two phases is? Uh, yeah, so there is also, you know, adaptation to other um, um, you know, other high order parameters such as um, um, facial characteristics and, and so on. Any questions? Hello. Okay. So I have a question. Is this because it is completely clear, or is this because uh, you are completely lost? Which one of the two? Completely clear. OK. OK. No, I, 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 um... I'm a little bit lost. Ah. OK. So can you express your? Uh, uh, Give me the starting point. Where can I find you? Where can I find you? Yeah. Um, yeah, I say I'm a little bit lost, but um, not sure in what point. <laughs> um, I see. Okay. Well, let me try um, again, maybe in a different way here. So this is a different slide. Um, so a review is um, that we have, um, say, a linear system. 
And the, in a linear system, the outputs, so if we do, um, um, you, you see my slides, right? With the yeah. black background? Right? Yes. Okay. So some, you know, the, the, one of the ideas of the linear filtering with um, multivariate case is that if you have um, stimuli that, for example, as a function of the spatial frequency, if they are non equally used, for example, one frequency is uh, overrepresented compared to um, some other frequencies in the input. Um, so in natural world, the low frequency dominate. So um, there is more input at low frequencies than it is at high frequency. So the, at the output, to maximize information, I would like to use all channels at equal um, Intensity. power. Yeah, power yeah. Yes, because um, um, they have the same limitations in, in terms of um, energy. So the... The solution is up to, uh, of course, at some point, the noise will, will uh, dominate, but in the range within which, um, suppose the kind of no neural noise is constant, then in this range, if the input, if the stimuli are decreasing, then uh, as a function of frequency, then because these stimuli are overused, then I reduce the selectivity to uh, the stimuli in such a way that after the pr um, I take a product, the output um, will be equally used. Okay. Does that? Uh, um, okay. 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 Um, so this is one statement. So in the linear system, now if you now you can like with this image with um, uh, of a girl that. Um, was a sharper image was sharpened or not sharpened you can say when it is um, blurred it looks more like this so you emphasize low spatial frequencies when it is um, sharpened you downgrade low frequencies and you enhance high frequencies is, is, is that is that okay yeah. any okay. questions about sharpening So the um, kind of one of the tests, so this is an example from my work, but then there are many other um, papers where we compare how neurons respond when you change the input distribution. And so to test these ideas, so when the stimulus changes, how should neurons change their um, selectivity and the theory will predict, for example, that they will change um, in, in such a way as to keep the product of uh, uh, stimulus power spectrum times the filter power spectrum constant. But um, we can see how exactly that happens because the real neural system might not be able to fully adapt um, due to various constraints. It, it can be tuned to natural scenes uh, statistics that are common and are unable to change, or there could be some possibility for uh, adaptation to local stimulus statistics. Is that OK? Oh. okay. Um, did um, I think I, I need some questions because the probability that everything is clear is uh, um, approaching uh, zero, I think. So, um. <laughs> no, I think this was uh, um, very explicative, but uh, probably there are other questions. Carlos, you are okay, right? Now? And, and with the next image, you're. So you should switch on the microphone. Is it on? Yeah. Yeah, I, I hear well, yes. 
Yeah, so the next image here says um, um, it, there is a series of papers of uh, probing different stages of neural processing with um, um, uh, stimuli that gradually approximate the natural world. So you can have photographs here or movies, and you can have white noise. So that is the case where you match the mean, for example, luminance between white noise and natural scenes, and you can match the overall variance. But the structure of the power spectrum is different. And then there are other experiments which match the power spectrum, but the kind of the burstiness that is present in natural scenes is not matched. And you ask whether the neurons um, can adapt to these uh, high order changes, like force order changes. Um, but in this case, it shows that you can uh, um, probe neurons with uh, stimuli with different um, power spectrum, which is second order statistics, and ask how the nonlinearities um, are uh, changing. Did I recapture uh -huh. part of the okay, audience? Okay, so we have a question there. We need the microphone. Okay. Uh, what is A in uh, in that uh, in that image? So A. Y you mean here? Yeah. So A is the normalization um, uh, scale. So you think about um, the the pixel size. So I need the, the frequent, the spatial frequency times um, a length scale to give dimensionless. Oh, okay, um, okay, okay. thanks. Um, yeah, so there is many questions one could ask. For example, I'm not, um, you notice that um, in natural world here, there are all one over F, so they're decreasing with um, frequency. But the horizontal and vertical um, components decay slower than um, signals um, at orientations at other domains. So it shows that, for example, natural since power spectrum is not um, isotropic. And... Uh, um, any guesses for why that would be? What do you think? What's the physical uh, force that um, creates dominance towards horizontal and vertical components in natural world? Yes, correct. Yes, thank you. Right. Yes, thank you. So, um, you know, either, you know, things are either standing up or they're falling down and lying down. So even in the, you, you, you would think that um, it's easier to see that in the office or in the man-made environments, you will have a lot of dominance of um, vertical and horizontal um, edges. But this is from the forest, and you still see the, the dominance of horizontal and vertical components. And in fact, some people turn this around and um, say, this is the natural world. We know this is the statistics of um, signals in the natural world. Then if you look in the brain, we are more, there are more neurons than code this... Um, vertical and horizontal direction, then oblique directions. And then once this is the perception, property of the human perception that we are uh, better at coding horizontal and vertical direction, that explains why we go to great lengths to create um, 
um, man-made environments where these frequencies dominate. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in, in this particular case, this white noise in natural movies were represented for about, um, um, I'm going to say 10 minutes. Um, yes, 10 minutes. So there is a limit to how much the neurons can adapt within these 10 minutes. But um, um, these are the results that I showed, that if you have a stimuli times filter, and uh, now with taking into account nonlinearity, you have, um, sorry, this is going back. So in the linear model, this is the prediction that stimuli times filter should give you the constant output. But now we have a nonlinear model, meaning stimulus times filter and then there is some nonlinearity, and um, in this case, the thought was um, is that you have stimulus times filter. It should be some function of the filtered stimulus that passes through nonlinearity, and it's no longer a constant, but it should be the same across different. Um, stimulus distribution. So when the stimulus distribution changes, the filters would change, but the filtered stimulus, whatever it is, which we don't have a theory for what's the optimal um, filtered stimulus distribution, should be constant. In the if um, we are working in a more general case of a linear nonlinear system, any questions about that? Uh, so we have a question there. Uh, she cannot hear without the microphone, sorry. Uh, my question is, why the filter changes in this case? Because if the stimulus, if we just change the stimulus, why the filter change as well? Um, so one possibility is that the filter doesn't change. And um, so imagine that the um, we, we, we know that natural scenes have certain statistics. Let's build a filter that is optimal for that stimulus statistic. And the animal then has this, um, these filtering properties. And uh, then it doesn't, and when the stimulus changes, the filter is not capable of changing. In that case, the, if we go back to the linear case, if the stimulus changes but the filter doesn't change, then the output will no longer be uniform and the information will not be optimal for that stimulus ensemble. It will be optimal for the first um, case but not the second. So the reason um, that one should expect some changes in the filter is that when the stimulus statistic changes, if you want to maintain efficiency for different um, environments, then the filters have to change. So they may not be able um, to change um, there, there can be limits on how fast they can change and at what frequencies they can change. But if they are completely rigid, then they will not be optimal for different stimulus distributions. Okay, Another you. way of re restating, yes, is that um, the, the optimality is tied to the statistics of um, um, signals in the natural world. Another related point is that if you measure, for example, this um, property here, um, power spectrum of natural scenes, and then you go to the beach or to the city. So this part here, 1 over f squared, is um, surprisingly robust to changes in the environment that are salient for us. 
Um, so it will be a small deviation in the exponent. It can be one over f squared plus minus um, 0.15, depending on the environment. So some aspects, if you can imagine that the neural systems, um, if they adapt, um, if they're designed to process natural scenes with this one over f uh, squared structure, they will be reasonably optimal under all uh, likely natural scenes distribution because the variation in the one over f uh, squared is small. So what we are more sensitive is um, changes in the high order uh, statistic. But that was not uh, um, tested in, in this particular experiment. So this um, experiment tests the changes in the one over, um, in the second order statistic. And, uh, um, and we observed that there is some capacity for change uh, at certain frequencies. So in this case, um, so I'm showing you here examples of how the filters change. So this was uh, under same neuron, under noise, and under natural scenes. Um, the filter has both uh, different te temporal frames shown here at every 30 millisecond resolution. And you can see that the filter is um, similar. So it has the same orientation. The neuron doesn't change the orientation. But <laughs> there are changes in the spatial kind of a surround structure of the spatial scene. So there is some blurring that is going on that is not reflective of the data, but um, of the presentation software. But what you're supposed to see is that there is um, more broadening in the case of the noise filter and uh, then in the case of the natural scenes filter. And that's quantified in this graph, that in the case of the natural scenes, which is in blue, there is less uh, um, low spatial frequencies. And uh, in the case of uh, white noise, there is more sensitivity to low spatial frequencies or more broadly. So that's... Um, um, repeat. Any questions? I would like to recapture the the audience. Uh, Carlos has another question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry. Just trying to recap a little bit. My question. My question right now is: uh, so there is an input, then yeah. there is a filtering before the neuron receives the input? That's correct? Or I'm, I'm wrong? It's almost, almost correct. So the way we model the neuron, and you can, um, so the, the model of the neuron here is that there is a stimulus, and this part is the neuron. The neuron includes filtering, and the nonlinearity. Now, it's not, um, it's important to realize the, the limitations of this model because for, if we are talking about the neuron in the visual cortex, this uh, filtering and nonlinearity um, is happening at many, many stages. So this is an effective filter and in effective nonlinearity after many st stages. In other words, uh, imagine the nonlinearity wasn't here. Then um, initial neurons in the retina would filter signals with small pixels. Then um, also in the retina, they would then take <coughs> averaging over bigger regions. And then they will align average in such a way as to 
obtain selectivity for an edge. And this will be the final filter that summarizes all of the processing from the photoreceptor to that part of the brain, like primary visual cortex. But in reality, there is this filtering and nonlinearity happening at many stages, and we summarize it as one effective filter and one effective nonlinearity. In principle, um, the other the generalization of this model include multiple filters and a nonlinearity that depends on all of the filters that you would be able to estimate. Now, please continue with your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, the spike will be represented in we seeing the picture or what will be the spike? Um, the spike is um, um, represents the response of one neuron. And uh, so now the many neurons collectively will result in um, you seeing the picture. OK, thank you. Yes, so we will talk uh, a little bit you know, more about the multi-neuronal case um, later. But for now, it's a single, single neuron. OK. Any, any more questions here? Uh, my, my question is, uh, in computer science, uh, when they um, uh, processing the, the image, they will use many different kinds, kind of uh, filter, like Gaussian filter, median filter. Uh, so my question it is, is, for a human being, for the new, neural, uh, what kind of filter we have? Um, so, in this case, and the uh, let me see how to answer this question. Um, uh, I will, I will, I will find a slide that I think will answer the question. Well, so the issue is that we are, we are estimating each filter for um, each neuron independently. And um, Um, so maybe I, if, um, yeah, I, I don't think I will be able to, um, so I will answer without slides and, um, um, the idea is that you, um, so for each neuron, the filter is different. And they're estimated by presenting thousands. Of, oh, maybe, maybe I do have a slide. Yeah, like that. So 
you present many, many thousands of stimuli and you observe which stimuli elicited a spike and which did not. And after building on this correlation between stimuli and the responses, you find the effective filter for that neuron and different neurons will have a different filter. To, in the linear model, we are just using a linear stimulus response function and we, you can average stimuli uh, that elicited a spike and that will produce an estimate for that filter. Okay, so um, maybe that, I think that's the, the, the best slide I have right now. So Tanya, are those uh, uh, what are called uh, Gabor filters in vision? Yes. So um, this is another slide that can help with understanding. This is from um, a Hubel Wiesel paper in um, um, they won a Nobel Prize for um, finding this uh, um, orientation selectivity in the visual cortex. So if um, you know a little bit of review of the say visual system and uh, so this is the macaque brain flattened. And um, if you go to this uh, visual cortex, which is in the back of the brain, so this is a schematic view of the uh, primate brain. So in the back of the head under the skull here, you have primary visual cortex. And here neurons are selective for edges. So that's the discovery by Hubel and Wiesel. And they show that if you take an edge and you, uh, it's almost horizontal, there is no response. If it is, um, you increase the angle towards vertical for that neuron, there is more uh, spikes. And um, so for that neuron, the optimal filter will be similar to the one that I showed. It will be a Gabor uh, that is oriented at 45 degrees. Um, so the filter is, so in their case, they discovered this as um, you may have heard accidentally, uh, ac um, accidentally because uh, prior to this, um, people were studying the eye that is missing here, and they were showing um, dots of light and uh, they were continuing with the dots of light in the visual cortex and they were not getting a strong response until um, the slide itself had an edge to it. So it was sliding back and forth and one neuron responded very strongly. So they found that these um, neurons in the visual cortex were driven by bars and edges which um, can be modeled as Gabor's. And uh, subsequent, um, um, but the method that I've been describing to you about this correlation, it is uh, useful uh, because it doesn't rely on the serendipitous discovery. I put on natural scenes in front of the animal, I record responses. If I record responses in the retina, as a result of um, processing, statistical averaging, I'll get filters which look like little dots. I apply the same algorithm to neural responses in the visual cortex, and I will get these Gabor filters. And uh, then it gets more complicated, but um, my group and others are working on estimating what are the relevant features across different uh, stages of visual processing. So after V1, there is a secondary visual area, V2, then um, V4 is the main one, and then um, goes to the, this part of the brain under near ears. This is uh, inferior temporal, so um, closer here. 
And here you can have neurons that respond to hands. So the neurons, you see, present an image of a hand or a mitten, the response goes down. Um, there are face selective neurons, but that particular neuron is not selective for a face, only for a hand. And the miracle here is that you rotate the hand and the selectivity comes back. So the big question both in um, machine learning research and in neuroscience, how to create selectivity for these complex objects that are invariant towards um, various positions and um, orientations. And uh, to, uh, to answer the question that was posed, which filter we are using, in, in principle, one should be able to correlate natural scenes with responses in different brain areas. And um, um, recover the relevant filters. But in practice, this is only possible for the first um, few stages of processing because of these nonlinearities. Be um, because we are attempting to summarize many, many nonlinear stages as one filtering and one nonlinearity. Mm. I, uh, I had a question. Yeah. Uh, have uh, these results ever been uh, uh, implemented as a uh, um, as a convolutive uh, um, convolutional, convolutional neural, network. neural network? Yes. So um, it's true. So. Uh, they, um, so now uh, one can fit convolutional neural networks to uh, neural data and um, using this convolutional neural network, one can recapitulate the selectivity that you see here. But there are two, in my opinion, there are two open challenges, uh, open problems um, that remain. One is that we have a brain. We don't fully understand how the signals are wired and what are the computations that take you from edges to hands in the brain. Um, because, um, and then you have a convolutional neural network that reproduces this result, but we still do not understand what are the um, computations. So. We have recreated the machine, but we have um, just as many difficulties looking inside the kind of a simulated machine as inside the real machine. Um, so that's one question. Because if, um, you know, technically speaking, if I going to encode a hand, so I need at least, you know, say 10 um, edges for all five fingers, but then it's across different positions, across different orientations. So there is a massive convergence of signals from V1 to even area V4. And what are the rules that guide that convergence? That is not clear, even though we can reproduce it in a convolutional neural network. So that's one problem. The second problem is that the result that we get with this convolutional neural network is less robust to perturbations compared to what we have in the brain. So some of you may have heard of adversarial attacks um, and adversarial neural networks. Uh, how many people have heard about those? There should be a yes, few, right? Two, three people. Yeah, so the adversarial three. attacks, I think, you know, worry people a lot because um, you can take an image and uh, perturb it a little bit and um, um, the machine will think that this is now something else. So it has uh, a lot of uh, concerns for... <clears throat> 
um, us relying on uh, artificial vision. You can think about um, in the case of um, self-driving cars or assisting a, a camera that assists the driver, you have a stop sign, you interfered with the image a little bit, and now instead of stop sign, it says, you know, drive 40 miles an hour. Um, or for security purposes, I, I, I can impersonate somebody if I know how to um, manipulate the input. So this happens much less in the brain through a variety of um, nonlinear error corrective uh, checks that uh, we don't fully understand now. Okay, I think there's, you know, maybe there's another question, or it's hard to see. Oh, I think uh, not now. Okay, so thank you for your question. Page. Yes. Thank you. And um, so, um, um, so, um, yeah, so these are the summary of... Uh, Oh, sorry, where is my... Um, so this is the, where are the Gabors? So the Gabor selectivity would be an example of select... Is, the reason it's shown here, because this is for the visual cortex, and uh, would approximate um, selectivity of neurons in the primary visual cortex. Um, so do we, do, do we think like we covered this part um, and um, uh, the, what um, here, what is presented and we can move forward with um, data processing um, inequalities and looking at multiple neurons? Yes, or what, what do you think? I think so. Do you agree? <clears throat> okay, yes. so what okay. we discussed so far was the optimal filtering for one neuron, but um, this kind of fo for one neuron as a member of the population, we say, well, this is what how each neuron should change. And now we would like to think about how to put these spikes um, towards perception, how to read out information from large neuronal array. So in this case, we have to do um, um, some, some mathematical background. So we I need to know about um, data processing inequality and um, other um, other features, because we would like, ideally, we, we have stimuli that will be eliciting responses across a number of neurons. It can be thousands, millions of neurons. And one of the open uh, questions is how to read out information from this many neurons. And I will show it to you, hopefully, um, on the next lecture, if not today, is that there is a simple formula, actually, that um, uh, you can read out information from arbitrarily large neural populations. And the reason for, because ultimately the algorithm can't be um, too complicated, um, otherwise how it will be implemented with um, neural uh, software hardware. But for now, the data processing inequality, how many people know about it? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. I, I mean, I, I think, uh, well, most of them should know it, but uh, maybe it's useful to re recall it. Yes, so it, it, it's a very useful theorem, a very useful check on, um, um, on, on various results. So, um, 
you know, to make sure that sometimes when you review papers or read papers or even do your own research, you want to avoid making a statement that you did some processing on the data and as a result of the processing, the information has increased. So <laughs> the theorem is that if a set of, um, if a random variable X uh, causes Y and Y causes Z, then there is the information between X and Y has to be bigger than information between X and Z meaning that because I did some additional processing to get from Y to Z, then information can only decrease or it can stay constant. So for the future applications that we will need, X will be the stimulus, Y will be the neural response, and Z will be our measurement of the neural response. So uh, we would like, ideally, we'll have to have such a measurement as to um, capture all the information that provided by the neural response because we will know that um, that's the best we can do. We cannot create more information than is um, captured in the neuronal response. So <clears throat> um, to prove this theorem, we, um, we need some other facts such as the chain rule for information. So um, the chain rule for information, if I have mutual information between X and joint variables Y and Z, so that is equal to information between X and Z and information between X and Y conditional on Z. Any questions about this? It's okay. It's okay. So this is information between X and Y conditional on Z, but Y and Z are kind of equivalent things. So we also can write it as information between X and Y and information between X and Z conditional on Y. But um, so actually what uh, I think I'm missing here is that X and Y and Z form the so-called Markov chain, um, which means that Y fully determines um, Z and X fully determines Y. So in this case, the X and Z are conditional independent given Y. And so uh, this last term is equal to zero. And so we get that information between X and Y is information between X and Z plus this extra term. Because information is a non-negative non, non quantity, we will get that uh, information between X and Y is bigger than information between X and Z. Okay, so that's our data processing inequality. Any questions? It's okay. okay. They saw this uh, in my course. It was a while back, but uh, they were traumatized okay. enough to remember, I guess. Okay. All right. So if, uh, so if Z is a function of Y, then um, I can only decrease or, or keep it equal. So maybe we can skip the second law of thermodynamics, um, but the entropy of the isolated system does not decrease. And we can model the system as a Markov chain. And uh, the transitions are being, is that also was covered in, in, uh, in the past course? So, I mean, it's not absolutely necessary for us. We can, um, um, but this also kind of the transition between states between um, uh, X and Y. 
So knowledge of the present state should be sufficient to determine the future state independent of the past. And you know that we can make various statements using this, such as the relative entropy between states has to decrease with n, and um, the relative entropy uh, of a current state and the stationary state to which the system is converging um, also has to decrease with n. And entropy increases if the stationary the overall entropy is increases if the stationary distribution is uniform. Okay, so um, any questions about um, about this? Okay. It's okay. No, no, no hands. No, it's okay. I I don't see questions. <clears throat> All right. So the next uh, question is about sufficient statistic. It, oh, we have a question in the chat. No? Um, can you clarify your question? Uh, mu is the distribution of um, um, the, dis the stationary distribution towards which uh, the system is evolving, and menu is the current um, the current distribution of states. Okay. okay. So then a very important quantity is a sufficient statistic. And uh, um, um, so we said that uh, I, for example, think about the neural response. I have a set of stimuli, I have neural responses, and I would like to take some function of neural responses. And I know that the information will, that I can capture from neural responses using this function will be less than what is provided in the full neural response. But there is a limiting case or ideal case of the so-called sufficient statistic, where I will take not full neural response, but some reduced function of it, and still capture all the information that is contained in the neural responses. So that's our goal, is to find sufficient statistics for neural responses. So a few examples about, um, about this. So if we have a set of observations, x1, x2, and xn, um, and these observations are drawn with a probability distribution that has a that is characterized by, by the parameter theta. Um, and so theta can be a particular stimulus. Then um, the sufficient statistics is, um, um, for example, it can be mean or any or some other function of the set of observations. So it's, um, in some cases, this uh, sufficient statistic is the one that forms a Markov chain. So it's the statistics that is fully captures information that is available between uh, the sequence and the parameters of the distribution. Um, so was it also covered? Um, can we skip over sufficient statistics or review it um, more fully? How many people know about sufficient statistics? Yes. Gibbs, you don't know? <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> the I information between the parameter uh, of the distribution and X, the set of observation, has to be greater than information between theta and uh, some statistic. And uh, it is sufficient when this information is um, equal. So that's our goal, is to find such summary that will uh, capture the information about the parameters of the distribution. So um, some examples. 
So if uh, we have independent and identically distributed sequence of coin tosses with unknown bias, then uh, what will be a sufficient statistic? That's a question. Um, so, <laughs> yes, for example. <laughs> Hi. Um, probability of zero? Uh, no, sufficient statistics is a function of the variables. Oh, yeah. The mean of zero? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, that's what we would like to know is the probability of zero is um, theta, is a parameter, and we would like to kind of estimate it by um, taking a function of um, the sequence uh, observations. Uh, is it the number of zero? Yeah, you can do that, yes. Okay, thank you. So, um, so number of ones or a number of zeros is a sufficient statistics. Um, other examples, sequences with the same means um, um, and n are equally likely. So, um, that's, I guess that's the proof. <laughs> but we all run now. We all know. Um, so, we now have a uh, statistics where the theta times the sum of these values, which is number of ones, and then the sequence itself forms a Markov chain. So that's one example. So then a Gaussian distribution, we know what that would be, right? With the mean theta and variance one. So variance is given, you need to find theta. So that will be, the sufficient statistics will be, what? So um, here the variables are not between zero and one, right? Or they are yes, so it's a Gaussian distribution. Okay. Um, what is sufficient statistics for a Gaussian, for the mean of a Gaussian? Come on. Hello. Yeah, the, the mean, the, the, the sum of the variables divided by the number of variables. Okay. Uh, yes, the mean. They are okay. Mean. Very good. Yes. Good. All right. So we don't need that. Um, so I think if we figured it out. So um, the sufficient statistics um, for a unit. We have a question in. Uh, why we consider, thank you for your questions, variance one, because then um, I will need another, I will not be able to get away with one variable. If I don't tell you what the variance is, then you have to also estimate it. So your sufficient statistic will have um, two parts. One will be the mean and the other one you have to estimate the variance. Um, and uh, what is important for, um, so let's see. Okay. So now, um, like for a uniform distribution, then it will be maximum and minimum. But um, 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 it, it's okay. So we, we don't need maybe minimal sufficient statistics if um, it is a function of every other sufficient statistic. But uh, what is interesting is, um, what we need to pay attention to are the exponential, um, the, the fact, the, the Gaussian is important because it's an example of an um, exponential uh, family of the distributions. And that's actually will be important for the neural case. So before we get there, we will, we can discuss the the so-called factorization theorem. So that may also have been covered in the class. And this is out of covering Thomas. So if, um, um, did people know about it or? 
Should I skip it? Um, so basically, if you have uh, a random sample from, a, as before, of the probability distribution, f of theta, and theta we don't know, and we need to form a function of x1 and xn to determine this. Um, <clears throat> so we need a statistics that will be sufficient if the probability distribution factorizes. So um, f theta as a sequence of x will be some function of x plus um, another function that depends on theta and on the sufficient statistics. So it's a kind of a coupling term between the parameter of the distribution and uh, the sufficient statistic and everything else that um, um, depends on the particular um, instantiation is a separate function. So if that happens, then our, uh, this will be a derivation of this. Uh, we will know that this function t is a sufficient statistic. So we will use it to derive a sufficient statistic for, um, for, neural, for neural responses. Um, maybe, do we need to go through the proof? Um, we can go or we can skip it. It's uh, the, the audience call. I think uh, we also did this in in class. So, but uh, okay. All right. So we, we can skip it and go back to neurons. So um, the key assumption is that we are going to model responses of an individual neuron as a logistic function of the stimulus. Um, by this, I mean uh, that the probability that the neuron produces um, a spike, um, which is Rn equals to one, is equal to one over one plus, and then there is an exponential of some function of the stimulus. And um, um, so um, the What's important is that once I have the sigmoidal tuning, what we will derive now is that um, it is possible to uh, form it in the exponential form and derive a sufficient statistic for the neural responses for arbitrary large population. Okay, so that's our goal. So our stimuli are vectors, they can be d-dimensional uh, vectors. And the neurons, um, to begin with, are conditionally independent, meaning that the probability of um, responses from two neurons uh, multiply given the stimulus. So there are no noise correlations. And then we will add noise correlations, but for now, it's a product. It is still a complicated problem because the neural responses are not independent because they are filtering, um, they are coupled through filters. Uh, any, any questions about this equation? So in the first equation, uh, uh, I think this is the probability that Rn is equal to one, right? Yes. So because the right hand side does not depend on Rn. Yes, right. That's correct. I lost that somehow. Yes, yeah, so this is um, should be probability of Rn equals to one uh, as a function of S and then um, similar to what we discussed in the past, Rn equals to zero will be one over one plus e to the plus two f of s. Okay. Uh, the, the opposite. <clears throat> okay. And um, <clears throat> now our goal is to show that uh, this p of r given s 
can be rewritten in this form. Uh, exponential sum over n, the various um, uh, spiking and not spiking from individual neuron times this function for, now specific for neuron n minus some function of the stimulus. Once we rewrite this in this form, our sufficient statistic will be um, will be this will be this term. Okay. And um, so now um, maybe uh, it's useful to write some things on the board. Um, and we will consider the case where this f of s is a linear function. Um, or maybe we, we should we try to rewrite. Um, uh, I will uh, have a derivation in the linear case, and then we will. Um, uh, you, you can uh, try it yourself for the uh, general case, it's the same um, uh, form. So <clears throat> um, let's see how to do it. So that's um, um, maybe I will ask um, for some help uh, with the blackboard. Um, let's see. So um, uh, maybe, um, so how to write it? So the way to write it is, um, let's write um, P of Rn is um, um, Matthew, do you think I, I can, let's see, can I see the blackboard? Yeah. Uh, Rn Yes, and this is one plus e to the fn of s, right? Yes, oh, let's see. Yes. So, so that uh, if you write uh, the p of r, even S is given S is the product of this thing over N of E to the R N times F N of S. This will be E to the sum over N R n f n of s divided by this product over n of one plus e to the f n of s. So in this part here, is independent of R. Now this part uh, is what is called uh, is uh, 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 well, we can say partition function or um, a n of s. Okay. So this uh, a n of s. Uh, is equal to the logarithm of uh, is a sum over n logarithm of one plus e to the f n of s. Okay. okay. Yes. Thank you. So the critical part is that our sufficient statistic is uh, sum over n, rn, and n of n. Uh, isn't there a factor two missing uh, p of R rn given s? So it, it is, um, no, I think we, because we wrote it as, um, um, because there is a difference between uh, if you multiply by the e to the f of s, both my equation, then um, um, 
Yeah, I think there is a factor two. I mean, there is only a factor two difference. Yeah, in, in the exponent. Okay, so otherwise it's okay. Mm. Uh, I was thinking that there, there isn't, but um, uh, so like in the second equation here on the left board, I think we have to write e instead of one we write e to the minus um no the denominator is e to the a n of s okay so um yeah of it, s is, it is it's just this yeah i i see okay so maybe it's two or two is okay um um as a cosine yeah so if um yeah, so you see I have two cos two cosh, so it's a two exponentials, e to the plus oh. and e to the minus, or it is uh, e, e to the plus times uh, one uh, plus e to the minus two. Uh, okay, so... Uh, ah, maybe your Rn is uh, not zero, one, but is plus one and minus one. And that, that is possible. So if Rn uh, is plus minus 1, uh, then uh, this thing uh, is, uh, is e to the minus f n of s uh, plus e to the f of s. Uh -huh. So which means yeah, that, uh, yes, yeah, so then uh, your first equation is OK. And, uh, and then uh, this is uh, e to the uh, minus fn of s, and like this also. And so this is uh, 2 cosine of... Uh, F n of s. Actually, then you call a n of s this uh, mm -hmm. this thing, right? Which is okay. your equation. Uh, 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 yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now, um, if you have a linear fun, if f n of s is a linear function, w dot s then our sufficient statistic is um, um, so then in, instead of fn of s we write s times wn uh, and omega does not depend on uh, n okay no it does w so w i guess i'm trying maybe it's omega or maybe it's um this uh, this function here. Um, okay, so then this is uh, let's call this uh, 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 e to the sum over n r n times uh, omega times s minus alpha n minus this a n of s and uh, so and then uh, you can write this as uh, s times e to the s times uh, t of r minus some a of s and then uh, your t of r t of uh, uh, r is equal to the 
Well, sum over n of this uh, omega depends on n. Is uh, sum over n of uh, uh, omega n times r n, right? Yes, very good. And, uh, and then, uh, uh, yes, and this A of S uh, is uh, okay. Yes. So now let's take this uh, into a very nice uh, box because I think it's a very important result. We just derived an equation for how to read out neural responses without information loss uh, by taking a linear combination of neural responses. Okay. Uh, for arbitrary large populations. And I'll show you the, the miracles of this um, equations. So um, kind of very, um, very important. So um, I will switch to PowerPoint and um, um, we will talk about applications of this equation and the history of it, how, um, you know, it was guessed and, um, okay, and then, um, so a very important equation. So um, some background, um, how it was discovered and not discovered. So before this equation was discovered, uh, people talk about population vectors. It's a, um, for those who work in neuroscience, many of you might have heard about this. Um, how many people have heard about uh, population vectors? Population vectors, who has heard about? I think no one has heard about. Okay, no one, okay, good. So then we are not redundant. So, there was an experiment by Georgiopoulos and colleagues in 1986, and um, <clears throat> they were studying movement, and it was in a, in a monkey, <clears throat> and monkey was making movements in different directions, uh, up, down, and so on. <clears throat> and uh, here is an example of the neural activity. And um, so 10 trials, 10 movements in this direction uh, are shown here with spikes from one neuron. So in this case, you can see if you look at this neuron, um, if uh, the movement is down um, to the bottom, um, then uh, it produces more spikes. <clears throat> so this uh, also goes back to this earlier question, what is the filter for the neuron? So they would say, oh, for this neuron, the preferred <clears throat> feature is the movement down to the right. And so we will assign to that neuron that vector, uh, Wn. And then they said, oh, but actually, um, what we notice is that if we take these vectors W, and in their case, they were normalized to length one, just the direction, and multiply by whether the neuron produces spike or not, then, um, so imagine that this neuron um, has a preferred movement in this direction, and if it produces a spike, then it's likely the movement was in that direction. If another neuron has a preferred direction um, diagonally to the top and it did not produce a spike, then its preferred direction will be downgraded. So the construction is you have many neurons. For each neuron, you find it its preferred direction of motion, the preferred stimulus, and that's that, and then you democratically weigh their responses, zero or one, or one and minus one, with their preferred features. And then, because each neuron has a preferred vector, 
the sum across the population is also a vector, so they're called population vectors, and uh, it, it is a vector. So it's, you, you have 1,000 neurons, but if uh, the motion of the hand is described by a three-dimensional vector, the population vector is a three-dimensional vector. And so this population vector uh, captures the actual movement that the animal made uh, quite accurately. So, um, so in the Georgiopoulos example, this is uh, um, an example of a democratic readout from a population. Each uh, neuron has its preferred direction and it votes up and down on a given stimulus, and it says the stimulus matches my preferred direction, or it doesn't. And we average across neurons, and we get the final um, movement. So that's the widely used um, activity um, construction, and you see it's kind of similar to what we have on the board, but the difference with the Georgiopoulos equation is that they normalize the vector to have unit lengths. And that uh, caused some um, um, necess necessitated uh, a series of papers that we will be <coughs> discussing um, maybe today, how much time? No, maybe next time. Um, but basically, it's a population readout. And um, 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 we will um, discuss how this population readout differs from the information preserving sufficient statistics that we derived on the board next time, but you see that they are structurally very similar. Okay, any questions? Should be a question. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, is... Uh are these neurons uh, linked uh, to the action of movement or to the perception of movement? I mean, if the monkey yes. is moved or if the monkey is still and the cage is moved, uh, do they trigger too? Um, so in this particular brain area, this is uh, monkey movement. Um, and then there are other brain areas that are, you know, would be triggered by when the cage is moving or where the visual stimulus is moving. But um, the advantage of this information theory derivation is that we have a general description, um, you know, for various kinds of responses. And uh, as you can see, uh, I'm writing here that it is um, widely used to decode place cells in the hippocampus, motor neurons, as is here, eye movements, visual neurons, sensory neurons. So it's a general, um, general equation. Um, and then in, in a specific context, you say, well, what is the space within which my, uh, these receptive fields or preferred directions live? To, to make it applicable, um, you know, what will be the space in which this population vector moves, the interpretation of it. Thank you. Okay. So I think maybe that's a good place to stop and then we will continue with um, 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 with interpretation of this equation, uh, I think it's very important and how it can be used for reading out neural activity. Okay, okay. thank you. So I have a question. So uh, so looks like uh, the, uh, there is a key assumption here that uh, um, neurons are independent and uh, so that the response is independent, uh, which I think uh, it's another important principle no, in neuroscience of uh, efficient coding. Is this true? Yes, it's, 
So, um, so the equation that we derived assume that it is independent, but actually you can generalize to foreshadow some of the discussion on Monday is that you can add some correlations between neurons as long as these correlations are not uh, stimulus dependent, they will not affect the form of um, the sufficient statistic. And therefore, um, and the slide is here. Um, uh, let's see here the equation. So if I can write the total probability distribution of responses given a stimulus, in this form which we had before, plus some uh, correlations between neurons, uh, so the JIJ. But if the JIJ are not dependent on the stimulus, it will not affect the form of the optimal readout. So we can use this equation in some cases with uh, neurons not being independent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, any question? Then, uh, if not, uh, should we stop here, uh, Tanya? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we continue on uh, Monday. Mm -hmm. and, thank you very much. Uh, very good. So thank you very much, Tanya, and uh, have a nice weekend. Nice weekend to you all. And uh, we reconvene uh, uh, on Monday at uh, 9 a.m., okay? Thank you. Recording Bye. stopped.